So now it's time to go back to our question. How many 6 hertz signals are there in our function f of t? Well, let's divide our function f of t by cosine of 6 hertz. Now we saw a minute ago that cosine, in the, in, when you're using these uh, even infinite integrals, is the same as doing cosine 6t plus i times sine of 6t, because the sine is going to integrate to zero. So we just swap it and put in e to the i 6t. But we can bring this part of the expression above the line, provided we change the sign on the argument. So we have f of t multiplied by e to the minus i 6t. So what that means is that f of t multiplied by e to the minus i 6t is the same as dividing our function by cosine 6t in this particular case. But this is also only at a particular point in time. So let's extend it to all time by performing an infinite integral. And what do we get? We have the infinite integral of f of t multiplied by e to the minus i 6t dt. And I'm wondering, is this in fact the Fourier transform of f of 6? Or is this, yeah, this is the Fourier transform of it. And it turns out, of course, that that is exactly what we saw at the very start. So we're seeing that all the Fourier transform is doing is dividing our signal by the basis functions and the particular frequencies. I'll, of course, be more rigorous at a later stage. So why do we care about the Fourier transform in the first place? Well, physically, it will tell you the frequency components of your function or signal. Most functions are composed of many different frequencies, and that's something I will discuss later. So for the moment, I'd like you just to accept that. Mathematically also, it is often simpler to manipulate the function in the frequency domain rather than in the original time or space domain. So what we do is we speak of decomposing our function into its frequency components in the Fourier domain. So let's remind ourselves what the Fourier transform looks like. So we are transforming from a function of time, f of small f of t, to a function of frequency, capital F of omega. That's the forward Fourier transform. And of course, we can go from capital F of omega to small f of t by performing the inverse Fourier transform. The point to note here is we're integrating out t in the forward transform, and we're integrating out omega in the inverse transform. So it's time now to look at some of the results of the Fourier transform. Let's say that our original signal is simply a sinusoid, so it's sine 6 or 20, 20 x is written here. Note by the way where I'm after getting these, this isn't my work, I've just taken it from the website written there. Now if I perform the Fourier transform, I'll get a peak at a single point in the frequency space namely at 20, which is what we'd expect because it is at 20 hertz. And the amplitude in this case is going to be one. So for a signal sine 20 X, which is one frequency, we get in the free domain or the frequency domain, a single point and we get a peak of amplitude one in this particular case. Note by the way, and this is very important, that this particular, this signal in the time domain is infinite in extent. You know, cosine goes from minus to positive infinity. In the frequency domain, however, it's very localized. And while I'm not going to discuss it, this is really where the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes from. Moving on, let's add two sinusoids. So we'd expect in the frequency domain to get two peaks and the peaks of the particular heights of the amplitudes. So we get a peak at 100 Hertz, and we get a peak at 150 hertz, which is exactly what we have up here. And note, in fact, that the amplitudes are also proportional, namely one is to four. So what happens if we get a slightly more complicated expression, like a square wave? Now, if we take the free transformer square wave, what we get are loads of peaks. We get lots and lots and lots of peaks of different amplitudes, and then we get a single uh, very large peak at a particular high frequency. The point to note here is that a square wave requires many different frequencies of many different amplitudes. Well, what if we look at this one here? This is uh, a, uh, this is an exponential function. So it's, I mean, this is a bit, bit, a bit mad here. 
but note that it is very localized in the time domain or the position domain and that means it's got to be very broad in the frequency or Fourier domain. And the point here is that we're after getting a Gaussian. I'm only after plotting from x is equal to zero forward, but of course you can, you can spin this around the y-axis and get our Gaussian. The point to note here is that discontinuities or sharp points in space require very many frequencies in order to represent that. So I'm just giving you examples of what the Fourier transform looks like. The next thing we need to ask ourselves is, where is the Fourier transform used? Well, when we analyze the mathematics, we find out that there are what are known as Fourier transform pairs everywhere. Now what's a Fourier transform pair? f of omega and small f of t are known as a Fourier transform pair. You could actually rewrite those two equations as a single equation, uh, which we will see later on. And that should be pretty obvious. And they would, be, they would be Fourier transform pairs. This is a Fourier transform pair, for example. Now, it's not one of the, the uh, well, it is. That is a Fourier transform pair. You get a, a sinusoid or a cosine, and you get a single point or a delta function. So when we analyze the mathematics of different particular physical scenarios, we see that in actual fact we're getting the Fourier transform. So if you're doing quantum mechanics and you look at the position space wave function, you find that it is in actual fact a Fourier transform of the momentum space wave function. So once you see that, you can begin using all of the usual results from your Fourier analysis. Another very interesting one is that a lens performs a Fourier transform. So a lens image is the Fourier transform of the object. So a lens performs your Fourier transform. Now that's something you may have seen in the lab using doing Fourier analysis and it allows you to remove different frequency components by simply blocking points of the image. Now I'm just trying to motivate why we actually use the Fourier transform and I'm not discussing that at greater depth. Now I would like to have some additional notes which will bring us from the beginning with power series and move to the actual derivation of the Fourier transform itself. So let's begin with power series. I'm sure you've seen in the past that a function, let's say f of x, can be written as the infinite sum, n is equal to zero to infinity, of a sub n times x to the n. The point is here that the power series representation of a function will approximate your function locally. It will not do it globally. So you start at x, a particular point in space, through the power series representation, you come to the function you're looking for f of x at that particular point. So a typical power series would look like the following. If you want to represent f of x, you would have the coefficients, the a sub n's, you have a0 x minus a to the 0, plus a sub 1 x minus a to the 1, and so on. The a just allows us to shift along the axis by a factor of a. So that should be nothing new to you. For example, if we divide 1 by 1 minus x, we get the infinite power series from n is equal to 0 to an infinity of x to the n. 